Tamastu, ma vidvishavahai, Om Shanti, 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 Om, may the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. All right, we're on page 71, page 71. Is there anything left from last week that needs to be discussed uh, before we uh, plunge ahead with uh, the next sutra? Is there anything at all that you would like to comment on from your own wisdom or experience? or uh, raises a concern or a question about this wonderful book, uh, How to Know God, which is Swami Prabhavananda's translation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. All right, very good. Well, let me just preface this by saying that this is Sutra 36. Do not think that there's anything whatsoever casual about the arrangement of this book and the numbering of the sutras. Vedic numerology is very uh, much a part of what happens uh, in things that are part of Sanatana Dharma part of the Vedic tradition. So the fact that this is numbered 36 makes it of extraordinary significance. In 36 adds to nine. Nine is a very significant number in the in Vedic numerology. It's both the end and the beginning. Um, and so uh, as we know, there are 108 repetitions of our, of our uh, mantra as counted by Amala. There are 1,008 names of Shiva uh, and so on. So we find it turning up in all sorts of places uh, in the, tr the traditions and lineages of Sanatana Dharma. All right, since, uh, since Swayam seems to be missing, I'll, I'll read myself. Sutra 36, chapter one, Sh Sutra 36. Concentration may also be attained. <laughs> First, I have to have the cursor in the right place. Concentration may also be attained by fixing the mind upon the inner light, capital I, capital L, fixing the mind upon the inner light, which is beyond sorrow, beyond sorrow. The ancient yogis believed that there was an actual center of spiritual consciousness called the lotus of the heart, situated between the abdomen and the thorax, 
which could be revealed in deep meditation. They claimed that it had the form of a lotus and that it shone with an inner light. It was said to be beyond sorrow since those who saw it were filled with an extraordinary sense of peace and joy. Now I'm going to read that again because Patanjali, this is what Patanjali meant by this sutra. Concentration may also be attained by fixing the mind upon the inner light, which is beyond sorrow. The ancient yogis believed that there was an actual center of spiritual consciousness called the lotus of the heart, situated between the abdomen and the thorax, which could be revealed in deep meditation. They claimed that it had the form of a lotus and that it shone with an inner light. It was said to be beyond sorrow since those who saw it were filled with an extraordinary sense of peace and joy. And by the by, Swami Prabhavananda, he says the ancient yogis, but he also believed in this heart center. And he said, it is what must open for us to progress in spiritual life. We must gain true and deep access to it and feel the living presence there, then we will make progress. So before we go on, is there any comment from anyone about what's been said? Any question at all about what is meant or any concern that this raises for you? George Harrison wrote a song called The Inner Light. I'm wondering if this is what inspired him to write that song. Whether this particular sutra did or whether it was the teachings uh, of, uh, uh, the, of, of Krishna consciousness, which of course <coughs> Krishna is said to appear to us as the inner light in the lotus of our heart. Uh, but uh, <coughs> certainly this is uh, when when Swami says the ancient yogis believed, uh, it, this means that it's interwoven with virtually every uh, spiritual path in one way or another. Certainly, Sri Krishna talks about it in the Gita, the inner light. So, good, good call, Brahmadas. Has Swayam ever joined us? I don't see her. I don't see her either. If okay. you want, do you want me to read? Oh, that would be that would be great, dear. If you have it there, I uh, do. okay. Uh, but before uh, we read on, is there anything else from anyone? I just I'll share. It's a little weird to share these things that seem very personal, but um, I, I new yogis, new new day today day. <laughs> present moment yogis believe in it too oh yeah uh, the, the that feeling of no you know being in this space of no sorrow is what i i don't know why but it's just kind of where i go in the morning when i do my sitting and it's when it comes it's I don't really necessarily feel it here. I feel it here, but I feel it just like beyond, it encompasses my body being, but also beyond. But it's, it, it literally will make any pain I'm experiencing at that moment, physical or emotional, just go away, just gone. It's yeah. just, I mean, it's like, it, it's, there is no sorrow and um it's just a wave and it's a great great way to 
start my day a necessary way, but it, I don't stay in that, of course. But just the fact that I can, that it's there, it is there. Yes, 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 exactly. And the, the living yeah. presence, as Swami Prabhupada called it, and in the in the presence of that living being, that living light, as you say, time, space, and causation, and all of their effects, the, the effects of the gunas, simply are suspended during that time. But as you said, you don't stay that way. Well, Sri Ramakrishna said, even the most expert singer cannot keep their voice always on the highest note. So anything else from anyone about this particular aspect? And you can see why now that the comment was made about this being an extraordinarily powerful sutra, 36, because it can it concerns the very nature of your being and what gives life, what animates you. It is that inner light that animates you. As it says in the evening prayer, uh, a breaker of this world's chain, speech cannot hold thee nor mind, yet without thee we think not nor speak. Speech cannot hold thee nor mind. This means it is beyond time, space, and causation. Uh, it is not something, it is what Jesus was speaking about when he said, the peace that passeth all understanding. He's speaking about this exact experience. Uh, brother, uh, he mentioned that it is between the thorax and the abdomen, which means is it between the chest and the abdomen? Like thorax yes. would be the chest, right? Yes. It's, it's, it's slightly, if you think about uh, what the yogis say, where this spiritual center is, it's, if you think about where your heart is on the left, it is to the right of the center and slightly above it to the to the right of it and slightly above it uh, that's where you'll see the diagrams show it to be so yes it's in the chest and there are many descriptions of it in the in the uh, literature of uh, the uh, uh, of the uh, sanatana dharma in the in the literature of the sufis and in the literature of the Catholic uh, tradition, especially, <clears throat> which has these pictures of heart of Jesus with this blazing light coming from just that place, which can also be experienced, by the way. Anything else from anyone? Ah, I see that there is a there is a square that says Tyagis on it, which may mean that our Beloved Swayam has joined us. Swayam, are you there? Yes, Brother Shankara, I'm here. Okay. Uh, are you are you able to read? Uh, read? Aren't you uh, our reader for this? No, I read for the oh, uh, that's Divine right. Grace. You yeah, read I for Divine Grace. Okay. The Cindy, Cindy has volunteered. Okay, Cindy, from oh, okay. the very earliest. Okay. <clears throat> from the very earliest times, the masters of yoga emphasized the importance of meditating upon this lotus. The supreme heaven shines in the lotus of the heart, says the Kaivalya Upanishad. Those who struggle and aspire may enter there. Retire into solitude. Seat yourself on a clean spot in an erect posture with the head and the neck in a straight line. Control all sense organs. Bow down in devotion to your teacher. Then enter the lotus of the heart and meditate there on the presence of Brahman the pure, the infinite, the blissful. And in the Chandogya Upanishad, we read, 
within the city of Brahman, which is the body, there is the heart and within the heart, there is a little house. This house has the shape of a lotus and within it dwells that which is to be sought after, inquired about and realized. What then is that which dwells within this little house, this lotus of the heart? What is it that must be sought after, inquired about and realized? Even so large as the universe outside is the universe within the lotus of the heart. Within it are heaven and earth, the sun, the moon, the lightning, and all the stars. Whatever is in the macrocosm is in the mic this microcosm also. All things that exist, all beings and all desires are in the city of Brahman. What then becomes of them when old age approaches and the body dissolves in death? Though old age comes to the body, the lotus of the heart does not grow old. It does not die with the death of the body. The lotus of the heart where Brahman resides in all his glory, that and not the body is the true city of Brahman. Brahman dwelling therein is untouched by any deed, ageless, deathless, free from grief, free from hunger and from thirst. His desires are right desires and his desires are fulfilled. And in the Mundaka Upanishad, within the lotus of the heart he dwells, where the nerves meet like the spokes of a wheel. Meditate upon him as Om, and you may easily cross the ocean of darkness. In the effulgent lotus of the heart dwells Brahman, passionless and indivisible. He is pure. He is the light of all lights. The knowers of Brahman attain him. This method of meditation is helpful because it localizes our image of the spiritual consciousness toward, toward which we are struggling. If the body is thought of as a busy and noisy city, then we can imagine that in the middle of the city, there is a little shrine and that within this shrine, the Atman, our real nature is present. No matter what is going on in the streets outside, we can always enter that shrine and worship. It is always open. Thank you, Cindy, very nicely read. So in the center, if you think about this, the heart is the center. There are three spiritual centers above it and three center, sp spiritual centers below it. It is the center of our being. And when it says, that it does not age with the age of the body, it can be testified from here that this is true. That this does not change. This does not, over all these years, from the 70s when there was the discovery to, to now. It does not change. Things change outside. And when it says that it is infinite and contains all that is in the macrocosm, is when within the microcosm, this is to be realized, of course. But the thing that we must understand about this realization is that it is infinite also. There is no end to it. As Swami Brahmananda, Raja Maharaj said, light, more light, is there no end to it? 
No, there is no end to it. So this is the glory, and this is why uh, what I said earlier and why this sutra is particularly worth our attention and our attempt to understand and assimilate and actualize what it means. It is extraordinarily significant. And you'll notice the Swami himself did not say much. He left it to the Upanishads. He quoted from three Upanishads, which are all uh, considered among the authoritative Upanishads. There are some 13 or 15, depending on who's counting, Upanishads that are considered particularly auspicious and authoritative. The Kaivalya, the Chandogya, and the Mundaka are, of course, among that number. And all of them, as you can see, agree on this, though each of these is speaking from its own experience. Anything at all before we go on to 37? Yes, brother. Yes. Uh, this is Jeff. Um, yes, Jeff. You just mentioned something about uh, something being discovered in the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what were you referring to? Oh, my own personal uh, spiritual journey, Jeff. Oh, I you see. Know, I, I came to Swami Prabhupada in, in 1973, February of 1973. And, uh, you know, he gave me... Uh, my instructions and uh, gave me great blessings. And uh, so that and uh, reading uh, set off, uh, you know, it was just nothing, nothing was ever the same after that. And th there came this glimmer of understanding of what is meant by this. Although I hadn't read this at that time, I had heard the same things from the Swami, both personally and uh, in uh, his talks. That's what was meant by the discovery made in the 1970s. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Anything else from anyone? And thanks for the question, Jeff. That was a good uh, definition. I wasn't trying to be evasive. I just was trying not to draw too much attention. Anything else from anyone? Well, I know there are some of you among those on the screen here who, who share this uh, discovery. So, uh, you don't have to say anything for your the, that that uh, energy, that uh, knowledge, to circulate among us. Anything does else? It like, uh, that, uh, is it that a person can see it, or what, what, how how does it feel like? Well, it it depends. Everyone experiences it somewhat differently, Rajiv, because each of us is unique. There is no such thing as a human being in a sense of a cut, cookie cutter human being. Just as if you're in a room full of people and you look around you, no one, no two people look the same. They share characteristics, but they're not the same. So each person will experience this differently. Some people experience it as a light. Some people experience it as Swami Prabhavananda uh, clearly did because he gestured to it this way. He said, feel the living presence. Some people hear sounds. Some people see images, uh, see uh, divine beings. There's just innumerable ways. But ultimately what happens is the attention becomes more and more one-pointed and it goes beyond all... Mm, description. It's, it is just what it is, which is 
uh, as the evening prayer says, speech cannot hold it or mind. It, it, it doesn't fit within speech and conceptualization. So at that point, there's no way to describe it. And it is the gateway to the highest realization. But that highest realization, as Sri Ramakrishna says, is strictly within the control of Mother, within the, that which manifests this universe. She is the grantor of liberation or the highest uh, realization. So, and, and, and Patanjali, as we'll get to at the end of this book, says precisely the same thing. The first six limbs of his yoga are something that you do. They, are, they involve purushakara, self-effort. The last two are something that happens to you, limbs seven and eight, which is the highest meditation and then liberation. Samadhi in that highest sense and liberation. So whatever, whatever you experience, you may think, well, this is, and bliss will come along with it, of course, but bliss is just a significator. It's not the thing itself. It's just uh, like if you uh, have some food, the food contains nutrients, but it also has taste. Well, the, the, the bliss is the taste of what you're assimilating, but it's not the thing itself. Speaking of food, um, I just love that the Swami agrees with me at the very end. I love how he says, no matter what is going on in the streets outside, we can always enter that shrine and worship. It is always open, kind of like the Waffle House for <laughs> spiritual <laughs> seekers. It's always open, no matter what's going on outside. Yeah. Even when the power's off all over the city, the Waffle House is open. <laughs> yeah. yeah the spiritual the spiritual sustenance is available to us 24 7 365 and the syrup on the waffles is bliss <laughs> well said jeff <laughs> well said yes the syrup on the waffles is the bliss what in are the grits <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> just a different kind of bliss i guess so anybody else have anything they'd like to offer? I, well, I'm talking a lot, but. <clears throat> well, good. Um, just what you were, um, were you talking to Rajiv about, was it Rajiv who asked the question about um, what it feels like? Yes. And you said, you know, people are different. And I was talking with <laughs> someone this morning about how very different human beings are. I mean, some people will say, oh, we're all the same on the inside, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the older I get, the more I think we are really different on the oh, inside. Yes. Oh, because yes. if you imagine, like just for say three minutes, switching places, switching minds, you know, with, with somebody that you think you know and are close to, you'd have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. I really think you would just go, you wouldn't know what to do with it, with that person's no. world. And it's it's because we're made of the gunas, the mind and everything, everything below ahamkara, everything below buddhi and ahamkara in the samkhya scheme of 24 cosmic principles. Everything is made of the gunas. And so, and their, their combinations are infinite and, uh, and constantly changing. And so this is why the Buddha pointed out to somebody who was talking about what was going on uh, in the past. He says, why are you worried about the past? You are not the person that you were a moment ago. And so true, true, but we all, I think, have 
we're used to our own patterns. You know, we do have patterns of change. Things are always changing within each of us. Yes. But we, but within the limitations of. The but it just, I was just agreeing with what you were saying that if we uh, were able to suddenly uh, be fully aware of the consciousness of someone else, the awareness of somebody else, it'd throw us for a loop. <clears throat> uh, brother and Cindy, um, I was reflecting on something similar to this uh, right before our our meeting today. Um, how uh, anyone is different from day to day or even moment to moment. And what got me thinking about that was um, how I might have a deep, rich experience in meditation one day, but not, not the next. Mm -hmm. But um, it's the gunas and whatever is going on with us in our lives. Uh, we're different from day to day or even moment to moment. Yes. And, and, the, uh, and, and so in the spiritual equation, to put it in mathematical terms, the sp in the spiritual equation, we are the variables. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're always changing. Yes. There, there, there are the invariables, uh, that which is immovable, eternal, uh, unchanging. Uh, and then there are, as you said, there are the 24 cosmic principles of which uh, most of them are constantly in flux. Anything else from anyone? All right. 37. Now, the thing to understand about 37, the number 37, this now begins a new sequence or series, if you will. 37 adds to 1, adds to 10, adds to 1. <clears throat> so just the word or by which, with which it starts lets you know that we're starting on a new way of being with this. So, Cindy, would you please read? 37. Or by meditating on the heart of an illumined soul that is free from passion. Let your mind dwell on some holy personality, a Buddha, a Christ, a Ramakrishna. Then concentrate upon his heart. Try to imagine how it must feel to be a great saint, pure and untroubled by sense objects, a knower of Brahman. Try to feel that the saint's heart has become your heart within your own body. Here again, the localization of the image will be found very helpful. Both Hindus and Christians practice this form of meditation. And concentrate, oh, excuse me, concentrating not only upon the heart, but also sometimes upon the hands and the feet and the whole form. Okay. Now let's go back to the beginning of this. I said it's it's a going a different direction. Now you're looking outside. Now you're looking at something outside of yourself before you've been looking inside now you're looking outside or by meditating on the heart of an illumined soul that is free from passion so would you then read on until i interrupt you please cindy brother Let may you... may i uh, comment on something first y yes please jeff um most everybody here is probably familiar with Roy Eugene Davis. Yes. And he used well, to say... Well, I don't know that they they all are. Roy okay. Eugene Davis is a follower of, of uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, and he established a center here in Georgia. That's who Roy G Eugene Davis is. And um, he used to say, um, tr just like uh, the Swami here does, um, try to imagine 
what it's like to be realized. Try to imagine what it is like to be enlightened. How would you live? How would you feel? What would you do? But then Roy Eugene adds, so what's stopping you? And uh, that's kind of an eye opener. And uh, I yes, I well, that's, I thought that's, I'd share that. That's always the question, isn't it? Exactly. What's stopping you? That's always the question. Uh, if, you yes. can if you can imagine it, then what's stopping you from getting there? Well, yeah. exactly. And this is why there's such a strong recommendation from here of that book, Love Poems from God, because this is the testimony that answers those questions that you just posed, uh, Jeff, about 12 illumined souls from different traditions around the world, uh, how they live, how they breathe, how they think, how they, and it, it is so, so, so easy to imagine yourself uh, uh, listening to their, to their works imagine yourself sitting beside them and thinking and being and and living as they do of course we come away from that but we have that experience so with that in mind with that book and that possibility of that kind of experience in mind please read this again cindy from from let your mind dwell to the end of the the Swami's discussion of the sutra. Let your uh, mind, let your is. mind, sorry. Some, somebody else have something? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was thinking, you know, I, I thought, uh, I I had this thing in my mind that if we, like, if we consider liberation at, at various levels, I mean, one of the level, the first level could be that whenever your mind starts to go into like the chatter mode and then you create suffering for yourself and you're aware you go back to the silence can we consider that as like liberation level one <laughs> well of course we can rajiv what is liberation <laughs> freedom from limitation every time we take a step in the direction of freedom uh freedom from limitation freedom from this bondage that we imagine ourselves to be in it is, you can say, liberation step one or phase one or whatever it is. Every time we become that much more free, which is the whole purpose of spiritual practice. And yes, indeed, it does happen little by little over years. You become freer and freer and freer of those things that uh, are called the eight fetters shame, fear, doubt, all those things. And so slowly and slowly, you free yourself from all those things. And so liberation, the final liberation is described by Swami Prabhavananda at the end of this book and uh, very eloquently by Swami Vivekananda in chapter four, of his book, Raja Yoga, which is his translation and commentary on these sutras. The final limitation is to no longer be a creation of, this, of the gunas, that that which was created dissolves itself back into the gunas, and that which was being held by the gunas, uh, uh, the, the, the city of, of Brahman, the city dissolves and only Brahman remains. And so that's the final stage. But we really, we can say those words and not know one tiny little bit about what that really means. But we can, we can, as this, as the Swami says, we can imagine it. Thank you, Rajiv. And thank you, Jeff. Swayam, did you have something? Yes, yes. Um, I was going to share this yesterday. Uh, somebody had shared this uh, video with me about mathematically um, describing this um, slow uh, progress to 
infinity. Mm -hmm. So the way they compared was if X is uh, that piece, ultimate whatever piece passes with, without, uh, I, you know, the ultimate piece, mm -hmm. and the denominator is um, various, uh, I guess, things. Uh, the larger the denominator is, the smaller the X is. So initially we start with, you know, maybe 20 things. We want job, car, this, that. And then you, it'll be X divided by 20. So the X value goes down. And then, uh, uh, oh, sorry, it, it's, you don't get that piece. It gets divided by 20, you know, to seek 20 things. Then you cut it down, come down to 15, then the burden becomes lighter, then cut down to 10, then it becomes lighter. And then um, uh, when it comes to like X by five, what he said, like five is the space. So like sadhus, they don't have like a dwelling. They just give up and, uh, or, you know, sannyasis. So <clears throat> that's one more gone. Then next is uh, the clothing. Uh, then next is the uh, food and then the prana. Um, so at that point, I think it is what X by, uh, one uh, so then that's the state of samadhi uh, so where you can come and go and breathe when you want and not breathe when you want and then but still that i is still left so that when it goes then it becomes x by zero which is then infinity well, um, so it, I, I thought it was a nice mathematical way to, what an to kind elegant of get to mathematical, that that's all i wanted to share what an elegant mathematical way of saying it. Uh, it will appeal to those people who uh, have a, uh, an understanding of mathematics. But this is the thing about these different explanations. But it is very elegant, you know, that X will have a smaller value when it is uh, divided by all those uh, objects that uh, uh, draw our attention and the fewer objects that draw our attention uh, and, and those fit under all those classifications of desires and uh, uh, attachments and fears and doubts and so on. All those things that hold our attention, the fewer they are, the larger the X becomes. Until, as you said, when there's no longer any denominator, no longer anything in the dividing it, then the X becomes infinite. So nice, nice, nice mathematical formulation. John Dobson would have liked that very much. Anything else from anyone? Shankar, Sumesh, hi. Yes, Sumesh. I, you know, after Jeff said that, uh, you know, we are the variable. And when uh, Cindy read this, I felt like, you know, uh, whether you are you you are concentrating on your lotus of the heart or somebody else's, you are it, it is a constant you are you know you are uh, concentrating on, and it's the variable that slowly disappears, whether it's your uh, heart or somebody else's heart. Yes, exactly. Well said. So yes, and uh, variable is a very good way to put it. We are the, the 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 city of Brahman is constantly changing. Brahman does not change, but the the city manifested by Brahman is in constant flux, and this is why Christ said, "Become passers by, become passers by. Don't hold to, don't cling to anything." Don't be stopped. Don't be captured by anything. Caught by it. Okay, Cindy, I think now we can maybe read on. Starting from let your mind. Please. Okay. Let your mind dwell on some holy personality, a Buddha, a Christ, a Ramakrishna. Then concentrate upon his heart. Try to imagine how it must feel to be a great saint, pure and untroubled by sense objects, a knower of Brahman. Try to feel that the saint's heart has become your heart, 
within your own body. Here again, the localization of the image will be found very helpful. Both Hindus and Christians practice this form of meditation, concentrating not only upon the heart, but also sometimes upon the hands and the feet and the whole form. And uh, he doesn't say it, but the Sufis do too. The Sufi form of Islam does that as well. Hmm. I'll read on. Unless there's uh, some comment, yes, indeed. Okay. Okay, 38. Or by fixing the mind upon a dream experience or the experience of deep sleep. By a dream experience, Patanjali means a dream about a holy personality or a divine symbol. This Swami Prabhupada said, by the way, these were not ordinary dreams. They were visitations. That's what he called them. So when we hear this language, and please read it again, Cindy, uh, this is what he means, that something from uh, beyond the gunas has uh, taken uh, your awareness, has become, come into your awareness. So please read that again. By a dream experience, Patanjali means a dream about a holy personality or a divine symbol. Such dreams can properly be called experiences because they bring a sense of joy and revelation, which remains with us after we have awaked. In the literature of Indian spirituality, we find many instances of devotees who dreamed that they received a mantra from some great teacher. Such a dream mantra is regarded as being just as sacred as one which is given in the waking state. And the devotee who receives it will continue to use it and meditate upon it throughout the rest of his life. There are devotees of this place who have had this very experience. So please read that again, Cindy. It, it, this is, if you feel like you must have a human guru, uh, please take some refuge in these words. Please read that again, Cindy. The whole thing are from, in, about the mantra. About the mantra. In the literature of Indian spirituality, we find many instances of dev devotees who dreamed that they received a mantra from some great teacher. Such a dream mantra is regarded as being just as sacred as one which is given in the waking state. And the devotee who receives it will continue to use it and meditate upon it throughout the rest of his life. And you can pray for this. You can pray for any of the great teachers. <clears throat> This is this has been there is so much in the Catholic literature of the Catholic saints that talks about the Christ coming to them, giving them what sets them free. Sometimes in that very moment, but other times something that they use for the rest of their life. So uh, this was true of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and so uh, he, he had this experience and out, out of that, in 16 years, he wrote 100 books, 16 years, 100 books, just imagine. All of them very worthwhile. But then he had the final realization four months before his death and said, all of that is now as straw compared to what I have been given. So there is no end to it, no limit to it. But don't think, if you, if you wish a human guru, they are available to you through the Ramakrishna order and, and elsewise. But if you, if you're 
way of being and way of life makes that less auspicious for you, then simply pray that you receive one of these experiences or visitations in which you're given a mantra. And there are any number of these. Swami Ashokananda, who headed the Vedanta Society of Northern California for decades and was a powerhouse, I mean a powerhouse. He had his instruction in these visitation state from Swami Vivekananda years and years after Vivekananda had left the body and the other direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna recognized Ashokananda's uh, uh, instruction and the mantra that he had been given and so on. Uh, he, they recognized them as true and so they sent him to head the Vedanta Society of Northern California. That's just one really notable example. Any comments or questions? All right, dear, read on. Another method of calming the mind is to concentrate upon that sense of peaceful happiness with which we awake from deep, dreamless sleep. According to Vedanta philosophy, the Atman in man is covered by three layers or sheaths. The outermost of these is the physical sheath, which is the layer of gross matter. Below this is the subtle sheath, which is composed of the inner essence of things and is the stuff of the spirit world. Below this is the causal sheath, so called because it is the web of our karma, the complex of cause and effect, which makes our personalities and our lives what they are at any given moment. The causal sheath is the ego sense, which makes us see ourselves and the phenomena of the universe as separate entities. In the waking state, Vedanta tells us, all of these three sheaths come between us and, uh, and the Atman, but in dreamless sleep, the two outer coverings are removed and only the causal sheath, the ego sense remains. It follows therefore that we are nearer to the Atman in dreamless sleep than in any other phase of our ordinary unspiritual lives. Nearer yet still so far for what separates us is the toughest covering of the, of the three, the basic layer of our ignorance, the lie of otherness. And this sheath can never be broken through by mere sleeping. We cannot hope to wake up one morning and find ourselves united with reality, <laughs> unless you're Scrooge. Um, <coughs> Nevertheless, some faint hint, some slight radiation of the joyful peace of the Atman does come through to us in this state and remains with us when we, we return to waking consciousness. We should try to hold it and dwell within it. It is a foretaste of the bliss of perfect knowledge. Okay. Now, another formulation of these sheaths, counts them as five, the innermost of which is called the Anandamaya Kosha, the bliss, the bliss of the, the highest form of Maya is, is bliss. And so the Anandamaya Kosha, and that is because it is the one that just surrounds the, the, uh, this, the shining, light, this shining inner light. Um, so we have the other four sheaths, as the Swami said, there's the two that are the physical, the, anun, the anamaya kosha, the food body, and the pranamaya kosha, these are physical. And then the um, uh, manamaya kosha, the mind, and the gyanamaya kosha, the intellect, uh, and then this causal body, or 
uh, Ananda Maya Kosha. But all of them are made of Maya. This is what he said, that uh, it is that sense of separateness, that sense of apartness that is uh, our, uh, the great lie, as he said. What were the words exactly? Looking, oh, go back. Oh, um, the toughest covering of the three, the basic layer of our ignorance, the lie of otherness. Yes, the lie of otherness. We are living a kind of lie, a kind of pretense. Now we're doing it because we want to, because we like it. So it isn't that we're being bad by doing this, but it's not the highest truth. It is a kind of lesser truth or evasion of the truth. And so, uh, and it ultimately our desire to uh, no longer live that way, live that lie becomes greater than our enjoyment of living it. And that's when we really begin to make more rapid progress uh, to get out of here. Um, so any final thoughts or comments or questions from anyone? We've got just a few minutes left. The, the lie uh, of otherness makes me think of um, Ramana Maharshi was asked, uh, how how should we treat others? And he said, there are no others. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the exact situation to which Cindy's referring is a group of people had come to see the master, Ramana Maharshi. And one of them was their spokesperson. And so he was uh, speaking with uh, Ramana and he said oh, well master if i achieve this state of unity and uh, and no longer seeing myself as a part uh, apart from uh, the truth the i and then he gestured to the people that had come with him and he said what about the others? And Ramana Maharshi simply answered, there are no others. So it is this mirage that we're caught in that makes it seem like there is, that there is something there. Hmm? Oh, my mind, caught in a mirage. Is there any water in what never was? No, you cannot drink from what never was. So let go of that mirage. So this is, this is, this is what we're in, is this state of, it's not quite the truth. It is, as Vivekananda said, a lesser truth. Anything else from anyone? Shankara, like some time ago when I was, I was thinking what science says about all this. So I, I looked at the quotes from uh, Albert Einstein, like, you know, go to the, the best scientists. So, and I was surprised. He said, so I'm just reading one of his quotes. I Googled it. A human being is separate of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. I mean, there's more, but that was like, that's what he also believed. Yes, in. oh yes. And he came to this conclusion very, very logically and mathematically. But his insight came from what he called his most cherished capacity. 
and that was the capacity for fantasy. What we're what the Swami is talking about here is imagination or, or uh, visualization, that kind of thing. So yes, indeed, Einstein came to these same conclusions. Would you say that again, please, uh, Somesh? That was beautiful. Yeah. A human being is part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. A kind of optical delusion upon an optical can optical what is that optical something or other but optical, delusion. Yeah, an optical delusion of his consciousness and what did meister eckhart say about when you see accurately when your vision becomes clear meister eckhart said the eye with which i see god is the same eye with which god sees me The same eye with which I see God is the eye with which God sees me. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing Einstein into it because it's very reassuring to us that one of the greatest thinkers uh, in science uh, of the past century uh, is very much on the same page with us. All right, dears. Om Haryom. Om Asatoma Satkamaya. Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya. Mrityorma Amrutangamaya. Abir Abir Moiti. O oh, dearly beloved, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless confusion to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through. Light us through and through with thy everlasting, shining presence. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the Lord's loving and protective embrace. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So uh, for those of who you who wish to join us, uh, we can next meet tomorrow morning where we'll talk about something uh, titled your spark of reverence your spark of reverence so until then any final thought or comment from anyone brother oh. shankara this is haima can you hear me yes i can dear okay. i'm at a different place at my son's place uh, i just have one comment uh, we do break through through the years of meditation i can relate yeah. to the breaking through the basic layer of our ignorance and the lie of otherness and the ego it will happen it does happen it may not be perfect but it does get closer and closer to where we could break through the ego and lie of otherness and basic layer of ignorance all these things happen then you find peace and it's a bliss it's kind of no reacting power we respond calmly we develop that uh, through the years of meditation. I noticed that within me. 
that's I just wanted to share that experience. It takes years, definitely not one day, two day. Maybe some people it takes uh, one year, two years, but it took me many years, many years. Yeah. Just wanted to share that. Thank you, Haima. Uh, Thank you, Brother Shekhar. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you, Brother Shekra. Thanks, peace, everyone. Peace, peace, and beneficence be unto us and to all beings everywhere. So until next time, dear ones, uh, sayonara.